You're here for EBS snapshots. We're going to talk about what's new for snapshots and some best practices and how um, a partner of ours, Commvault, is leveraging some new features as well that we launched to help make things easier for customers. My name is David Green. I'm a principal product solutions architect on the AWS team. I'm joined by Shailu Verma, who's a senior manager of product management on the team that builds EBS, and Rahul Pavar, who is the vice president of product over at Commvault. So if we have any questions on today's session, we're going to stay off stage and answer everything. So please, please find us. In today's session, I'm going to give a quick overview of AWS EBS and how it fits into the overall storage portfolio that we have. Uh, we're going to go into snapshots and some functions that they serve, how they differentiate themselves from you know, maybe traditional snapshots that you might use in other storage systems. And we're going to cover um, some things about multi-volume, encryption, and some new best practices that we have, and also new features that we launched in the last year to make it a lot easier to consume snapshots and use them. So from the AWS storage portfolio side, we really have three core offerings for storage. We have object store, block, and file. So with object, we have S3, and block, we have EBS, and file storage, we have um, EFS, which is NFS across an entire region. We have FSX for Windows, FSX Luster, which is awesome, because it's tens or hundreds of gigabytes per second, and then when you're done, you just destroy the file system. Um, and we have lots of ways to move data in and out of their cloud and manage it as well. So within Blockstore, we have three offerings as well. Uh, we first launched EC2 with EC2 Instant Store, and we still have it today. So Instant Store are the physical disks that sit inside the, um, the hardware that's running your EC2 instance. And they come in SSD or HED flavors. And then with EBS, EBS is managed storage, and we have um, SSD-backed volumes and also um, yeah, SSD-backed volumes and HDD-backed volumes. EC2 Instance Store is ephemeral, so which, what it means is if you stop the instance or if you terminate the instance, the data is going to be gone with the instance. It's really designed for short-lived um, functions because you know, when that instance goes away, the data goes too. Um, you can do... On EBS, we support snapshotting, which you cannot do on Instant Store. However, you can use Instant Store with other tools to um, provide backups. And EBS is persistent, so that means that we actually decouple the EBS volumes from the EC2 instance. So you can stop an instance and maintain your volume if you want to. And we have different flavors there as well. We have SSD and HDD backed volumes. So EBS was launched over 11 years ago, way back in 2008. EBS is block storage as a service. And what's really interesting with EBS, it really grew since then. So we have millions of developers using EBS to store exabytes of data across millions of volumes with trillions of operations daily. So it's a, it's a very large, mature service. We have encryption support for EBS, and encryption, which we'll go into um, later on in our talk today, encryption is literally a checkbox. There's no performance degradation on your volume um, as long as you're using um, the four and five instance types, so C4, C5, M4, M5, and so on. And we support point-in-time snapshot. All blocks that are written to EBS are replicated, which allows us to avail um, deliver the higher availability and durability associated with EBS. And EBS is designed for five nines of availability and 0.1 to 0.2% AFR, our annual failure rate. So what that really means in real life is if you have, let's say, 1,000 volumes, you should plan to have one or two of those volumes fail and not be recoverable. And that's why it's important to take snapshots. So although the name is snapshots, I kind of want you to think of it a little bit different, because maybe um, you know, other file storage or data storage you work with can do a snapshot of your data. We do that as well, but we also do different things with the snapshots. So for example, you can take that snapshot and you can copy it within your account. You can copy it across regions. So I'm taking a snapshot, let's say, into Oregon, and I want to copy it into you know, Dublin. 
you can copy it across accounts. Maybe there's use cases to share data from you know, prod and you know, development. Maybe you want to actually have snapshots go into a compliance account and say, all my snapshots and prod go into this compliance account that gets stored and can't be accessed. And these are used to create AMIs. So how does a snapshot work? When you have an EBS volume, an EBS volume lives within a zone, an availability zone. And AWS has regions, and within the region we have these zones, and EBS lives within one of those. So when you create the snapshot, you call the EBS snapshot service, and then we return a volume snapshot ID. So as soon as you get that snapshot ID back, that means that all the data that existed on the disk at the time of that snapshot has been committed to the snapshot service at which time the service starts sending that data into S3 to be stored in S3. S3 is a regional service, so it's deployed across the entire region, and additionally, S3 does not acknowledge a successful put before we actually commit that data to at least three availability zones in S3. So it's very durable, it's designed for 11 nines of durability. Step four is optional, you can monitor the progress of your snapshot. And for best practices, we suggest also snapshot early and snapshot often. And we'll go into how we can automate these snapshots. So now we know about volume, kind of high level on snapshot. I want to go a little bit deeper into snapshots. In this case, I have a one terabyte EBS volume I just provisioned. And I'll go ahead and take a snapshot. Because there's no data in my volume yet, the snapshot is empty. Um, Although you may see in the EBS um, snapshot web console, the size would say one terabyte, that's just the volume size, not the amount of data stored in that snapshot. So in this case, there's no data, I'm not being billed for anything, there's no costs for this. All right, let's start adding some data. So I'll add blocks one, two, and three to my volume, and I'll take a snapshot. EBS copies only what's changed. So we see these blocks as changed blocks, and we're gonna copy that changed data into the snapshot service. And your build for um, blocks one, two, and three. I'll go ahead and delete some data from my, my volume. I'll delete one and two, I'll keep three, and I'll add some more data. I'm gonna add blocks four, five, and six. And I'll take a second snapshot. Now, because this EBS snapshot service only copies what's new, we're not gonna copy three again, because three exists within that service. So we're gonna reference three and only copy the new data. And snapshot two, I wanna point out, you're only being billed for the unique data in that snapshot. In this case, it's blocks four, five, and six. Okay, I'll go ahead and add some new data, take another snapshot, Again, I'm not copying what exists in the service, I'm copying new data, so I'm gonna reference this data from the other snapshots, and then copy only unique data to that snapshot. And you're only billed for these, these three blocks that are new, seven, eight, nine. So what happens if we delete a snapshot? So we have these three snapshots now, I wanna go ahead and delete one. So I'll delete snapshot one. And when you do that, only data that's unique to that snapshot gets deleted. In this case, the only data that's unique is blocks one and two, because three I already have in the snapshot two. So I delete that data, the bill goes down to zero because it's deleted, it's gone. And then to keep snapshot two intact, we just simply move that data that existed in snapshot two, or, sorry, snapshot one over to two, and you see the billing change for that. So now we're being billed for those four blocks. So. We'll, in practice, what would happen is maybe a customer comes up to me and says, hey, I have 10 snapshots on my boot volume, and I deleted five of them, and my bill went down marginally. And maybe it's because there's not much that changed across all those 10 snapshots. Maybe some data has, but it's being referenced across the rest of them. So although we act as an incremental service, as you see when we take a snapshot, we move what's new, every single EBS snapshot functions as a full point in time backup. So that means that every snapshot contains all the info needed to restore your data from the moment that snapshot was taken to a new EBS volume. And to reduce cost, we're only billing for the incremental changes.
So taking a look at snapshot consistency. So Jan and I were talking about this just before the session. Like, well, how does it work for crash consistency? So for crash consistency, EBS snapshots are crash consistent. So that, the easiest way I like to think of that is if you have um, a USB drive plugged in your laptop and you pull that drive out, whatever existed on your drive at the time you pulled it out is what's on the drive. So maybe if I have my PowerPoint deck open, I'm making edits, but I don't save it yet, I'm not gonna have that data on my drive. And that's crash consistent. So when we take a snapshot, anything that existed on the disk at the time you took that snapshot is what we have in the snapshot. And then there's application consistent snapshots. And with application consistent snapshots, what you would do is you would maybe stop your I.O., you would flush out any data to the disk, and you'll take a snapshot then. So that way your application goes, everything I have is committed to disk, snapshot that, and then you can unlock I.O. and start, you know, start writing again. With the EBS volume, you can have one volume attached to one instance at a time. However, one instance could have multiple volumes attached at the same time. So let's say I have this case. On my left side, I have my EBS boot volume, and then I have four EBS data volumes. Uh, for best practices, we suggest separating boot and data. That way you can keep your boot nice and clean and small, and then you can manage your data independently of boot. And then the questions I would regularly get after the session, too, is, well, how about a RAID volume? Let's say I'm doing a RAID 0 across my, my EBS volumes because I want to get more capacity or more throughput, how do I snapshot those all at the same time? Um, earlier this year, back in May, we announced EBS multi-volume crash consistent snapshots. Uh, this is supported through the CLI or SDK or API. I'm, I'm just gonna visually show it through the web GUI. And this is actually really cool. So I'm gonna select a resource type. Uh, before, I'd select a volume, and I select my volume ID and snapshot that. But now you can actually select your instance, and then that's going to populate all the EBS volumes that are attached to that instance. In my case, I am not snapshotting the root volume because I'm using an AMI. I'm not really doing anything special to this. I only want to capture my data volume. So my, my boot volume is, um, is grayed out, and I only have my data volumes there. I'm scrolling down the page. You can actually copy your tags from the volume as well. So this is really powerful because if I'm naming my, my volume for um, my tagging, maybe I have environment tags or um, version tags or cost center tags, that gets pushed down to my snapshot. And in this case, I'm going to add a new tag. I'm going to add a tag called, um, called RAID with the value of yes. Once the snapshot takes, I go to the snapshot page, and you'll see my four volumes here. Um, and the, the names got copied over because that, that was named in the actual volume tag. Also, other things like my environment of prod got copied over. And then my new tag I added at time of snapshot was RAID, um, which is a value of yes. And the reason I add the RAID one is because I want to be able to know that this is part of a RAID set. So if I'm doing a restore later, I want to know, OK, all these four disks are part of this RAID set. And of course, you can name these whatever you know, makes sense to you and your business. Well, how about automating VSS um, support? So VSS is a um, volume shadow copy service. It's a Microsoft backup technology that allows developers to create services that can be backed up by any vendor supporting VSS. And VSS prevents data inconsistency by automatically handling stuff like you know, suspending I.O., flushing data down to disk, and then creating a snapshot. Um, supported in services such as um, Microsoft SQL Server. And with VSS, it's nice because you don't have to really manage your own code on the host to do this for you. Um, and at AWS, we have a service called SSM, it's Systems Manager. And Systems Manager lets you run code or run you know, PowerShell scripts or Bash scripts on a bunch of hosts. And you can actually automate this to say, take a VSS enable snapshot every hour, every two hours, whatever you want to do. And then this way, it automatically, we'll just suspend I.O., take a snapshot, and then restore, or restore I.O., uh, without having to have, again, like your own like, cron jobs or scripts or stuff like that. I, I mentioned before that encryption is, um, it doesn't impact I.O. for our, our newer instance types, um, since C4, or this four instance type. Um, so there's no reason not to enable encryption. 
We integrate with KMS, which is the AES-256 encryption. We also interact with um, customer master keys, CMKs. And when you enable encryption, the following data is encrypted. The data that is on your, um, that's in flight between your EC2 instance and your EBS volume. The data that's stored at rest within the EBS volume. And then any snapshot that gets created from that volume is also encrypted. So please encrypt. Again, there's no reason not to. Additionally, when you copy an unencrypted snapshot that you own, you can encrypt it during the copy process. So this is powerful. Maybe customers go, look, I have all these snapshots that are unencrypted. How could I make this encrypted? You just copy it, and you specify which key you use during the copy process. And also, if you already have an encrypted snapshot, you can actually copy it to a new key by copying it. Another powerful thing that came out of this was the ability to launch an instance from an AMI and have an encrypted boot volume at launch as well. So if you have compliance or regulatory um, uh, security measures that let you, uh, that the mandate that you've run boot as encrypted, it's super easy to do. You just launch it and it's, um, it's, yeah, it's pretty nice. So while we're talking about encryption, I want to take a quick look at our local NVMe disks in the, um, in the instance types listed above, like the um, you know, C5D, the i3, and so on. These drives are always encrypted. So um, we went into this a little bit during the, main, uh, the big keynotes, talking about how we do this. We use XCS AES-256 block cipher, and this is implemented on a hardware module that's on the instance. And the encryption keys are generated by that module, and it's unique keys for every single device in there. Additionally, when you stop or terminate the instance, those keys are destroyed, and you can't get, you know, you can't get data back. You cannot disable encryption, and you cannot change the way that it works. And I'm saying snapshot early, snapshot often, and I'll get questions like, well, hey, this sounds expensive. There's all these snapshots. How do I even know what I'm spending? Um, and it's not that hard. It's, it's super easy. Please tag everything. So you should tag your instances. You should tag your RDS. You should tag everything. That's just general best practice on AWS. So in this case, I'm tagging you know, environment, version, you know, maybe security, classification, cost center, whatever else you want to tag, you can tag. However, when you create these tags, you have to actually enable them for cost allocation. So when you make the tag, you can go to the cost allocation tags under billing page, and here's a list of all my tags. On the right side, the ones that are active, um, I've enabled for, um, for cost allocation. So in this case, I have my environment tag, it's already enabled. Um, but if you make a new tag, go here, enable it, and that way it'll be actually part of your cost allocation. And something I want to point out, I made a mistake here. This is my account. Um, I have two environments. I have one that's capitalized and one that's lowercase. Um, so it's important to know that your tags are case sensitive. So just please be aware of that um, as you tag uh, across, across your fleet. And here's what you can do with your tags. Um, in this case, I'm showing EBS, and I'm sorting by the group environment, or the tag environment. And in this case, I have two environments in my account. I have test and prod. And in, um, <laughs> in my slide here, I'm actually spending more money on my test environment than my prod environment, which maybe I don't want to do. Maybe I should find ways to not spend as much money on tests and you know, delete stuff or just not use as much. And this gets really cool because you can look at this across bigger accounts, across multi-account, you can look at it across tons of environments and really get granular insights to where your spend is and how you can reduce that. And with that, I'd like to introduce um, Shailu to the stage. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, my name is Shailu Varma, and I'm a senior product manager at EBS. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, a few things that we've been at work uh, through 2019. And um, so these are four areas that we've been focused on and have launched a bunch of new capabilities through 2019. And the four areas that I'm going to spend time on are, one, security. So we've been pretty hard at work at making security enabled much easier on EBS resources and EBS snapshots. Secondly, um, we've launched a number of features, which I'll share with you, but we've also been focused on making sure that 
taking snapshots, retaining snapshots, deleting snapshots. In other words, managing the life cycle of snapshot becomes simple and automated. So we'll share some, some work we've done in that area. Third, um, on November 20th, we launched a super exciting feature called Fast Snapshot Restore, which enables you to recover from snapshots much faster and more predictably. So we'll dive into that. And finally, um, two days ago, we launched a brand new set of APIs that give you direct read access to data and snapshots. So um, we'll, we'll go deeper in that as well, and we'll be followed with, uh, with, with Rahul after that. So talking of security. So easier ways to enable security. Through 2019, we launched three sets of capabilities. First, we now enable you to launch an encrypted volume from an unencrypted snapshot, and in that context, change the encryption key as well in a single step process. So we'll, we'll dive into that. Secondly, now you can share an encrypted snapshot with a custom key across accounts much easier than you did before. And thirdly, we are, we've enabled encryption by default at an account level in a region with a single setting. So three things, lots to digest. We'll go one by one, and it'll all be pretty obvious. So the first one, um, encryption, uh, launching encrypted volumes from an unencrypted snapshot or army. So this is a pretty common use case. You have an unencrypted army, or you may have an encrypted army, and you want to change the encryption key and launch an encrypted volume, right? So uh, to explain to you the change that we made, let's make it really simple and walk you through. This is what you had to do before. So you would had a two-step dance in some ways, right? You have to take an unencrypted snapshot, encrypt it, so make a copy of it, and then create a volume from it. So there is, A, the orchestration associated with it, and of course, the snapshot cost. What we've done now is made it a single step process. So with an unencrypted snapshot, now you can launch an encrypted volume with a single step, right? And, and this is how it works. On a console, you click on create volume, and you then identify the snapshot. You identify the type of volume that you would need to create from the snapshot. You provide your encryption key, and it could be the, uh, a default key, or it could be your specific key that you need. And it's as simple as that. And I've got the CLI here as well on the site, so you can see how it works from a CLI perspective. So one, one step process to create an encrypted volume from an unencrypted snapshot. Um, moving to sharing armies or snapshots across accounts. Um, like I said, this is a pretty common use case where you have a golden army and it's an account one and you want to share it into an account two and, and it's encrypted with a custom key. Um, so what you have to do again is a two-step dance. You copy the army or the snapshot into account two. Um, you can change the encryption or you can keep the same encryption and then you launch a volume in account two from the snapshot of the army that has been copied. Right? So you thought, hmm, you could probably do better than this, right? And now you can essentially launch an encrypted volume just by sharing your encrypted snapshots across accounts. Makes it really simple for some of these launches that you need to make happen on your, uh, on your armies. And this works only with custom CMK. Um, I had a lot of questions early on on default CMK. Um, we don't have that for default CMK right now. We have that for custom CMKs. Um, how it works on a, on a console is you have to set the right permissions on the source account, the account one, and the destination account. And once you have the right permissions, um, which is what the CLI here shows, you can set that up on a CLI very easily. You can then launch an instance and you can change the encryption key on the in instance as well. So, um, and, and this is something that we recommend so that your, in, your volume and your snapshot in account two, which is your destination account, is distinctly different from that in your source account 
which is account one, right? And again, it's a single step process now. Moving to really getting to the source of all this issue, right? What if you just had an automatic way to make sure that every single volume created on your account was encrypted, right? Just make sure that the bleed stops right from the very beginning. So early on, what you had to do was you had to create IAM policies that would prevent a volume to be launched if, they were, if it was unencrypted, or you would have your scripts that would check for unencrypted volumes or snapshots. We've essentially made this much simpler, um, where we now have a single click setting at an account level where you can ensure that every volume launched in that account is encrypted, right? So it just stops the problem right where it typically tends to begin. And, and this has no change to your workflow, and it ensures encryption at, by default at your at a, at account level. And it's really simple. On your console, uh, in your setting, you essentially click the button which says, always encrypt a new EBS volume. And you can use a default key or a custom key. Right? And I know I've, I walked through a bunch of these uh, uh, you know, walk them through step by step, but there's a lot to absorb here. Um, if you remember just two things here. One is, for all your pub public snapshots, please ensure you can keep tabs on it, monitor access. And secondly, use encryption by default at an account level. That just ensures that you are protected. All right? So moving on to our second area of focus, which is simpler snapshot life cycle. So in, in mid-2018, we launched a new feature called Data Lifecycle um, Data Lifecycle Manager, DLM as we call it, with a focus on snapshots. So we began with the focus on snapshots. And we essentially set out the goal to completely automate the process of creation, retention, deletion of snapshot. And we made that happen through tags and policies. So the way it works is you pick an instance or a volume that you would want to back up with tags. You create your policy. The, the policy essentially states when you want to create, how often you want to create your snapshots. You can set your um, retain policies, like how many snapshots you would need to have on retention. So you could say, I need 10 snapshots, and the 11th one gets deleted. You can um, control your cost by, by putting the retention numbers. You use IMs to make sure that the DLM policy access is controlled, so you have protection there. And the best still, DLM was at no, is at no cost, so it's free. And so we've seen some amazing adoption on DLM, and I really encourage all of you, if you're not using DLM, to, to begin using DLM and to look into DLM because it completely automates your cost management in your snapshot, um, uh, taking snapshot, retaining snapshot, deleting snapshots. Uh, and it's super simple to use, and I'll walk you through it. So as I was mentioning, this has been adopted by a lot of our customers, and we continue to make enhancements on this like we do with everything here at AWS. So in 2019, we added support for crash consistent snapshot, the feature that David walked you through, where you could take snapshots across multiple volumes so now that is supported with, with DLM. And secondly, we added additional schedules for taking snapshots at two, three, four, six, and eight hours. Uh, I'm super happy to announce that on November 25th, we announced a new feature that now gives you the ability to retain by time. So instead of saying, I want seven snapshots or 10 snapshots, you can say, I want daily, weekly, monthly, yearly snapshots. And, and the rest automatically gets deleted. So um, here's an example of a policy. So for example, I, I would want to, all my uh, EC2 instance root volumes, I would like to back them up once a day and save them for seven days. So my policy essentially looks like this. I use the tag um, volume type root. Um, David Ment talked about tagged as well. I create it every 24 hours. I have a start time of seven UTC as an example, and I retain 
the last seven. So this is an example of a, of a policy. How it works on a console is here is a volume um, and, and the tag associated with the volume. I then pick either a volume or the instance. I, I, I input the tags. I can put additional tags on this. I can pick the, the, the cycle taking every 24 hours here. And then, as I mentioned, you can pick the retention, which is on count-based or age-based. And then you can pick your day, week, month, and year. Right? So this is as simple as that. And, and you have now automated your backup and snapshots on EBS. And we'll continue to make enhancements on DLM as we go through uh, 2020 and uh, certainly look forward to your feedback here to see how else we could improve DLM. Moving to the third area of focus, which is fast restore from snapshots. Um, we call this feature FSR, or fast snapshot restore. And as the name implies, it really gives you benefit in two areas. One is a faster recovery from snapshot, and B, a more predictable recovery from snapshots. So let me walk you through how this works and what it means. So, to go a little bit deeper into what it means, um, let's go through this example of what do you need to do or what happens when you want to recover data from a snapshot. So you have a volume, you take a snapshot. Now you want to date, recover data from a snapshot. You're essentially transferring blocks of data from a snapshot, which is an S3, into, into your volume, right? And so any I.O. or latency, let's say you're running a database and you're, you have a query, and the query is based on the data blocks that are being transferred from S3 to the volume, will have an additional latency associated with it. And, and so you have this latency factor happening in, as the data blocks are being transferred from the snapshot into the volume. We call this pre-warming. We also use the term initialization. Right? Um, now, you can prevent this by forcing all the blocks, by using a DD command to transfer all the blocks from your snapshot to the volume. In both cases, there's a time associated with it. In the case, the first case, um, when, when you're transferring blocks based on uh, queries, we call that process lazy loading as well. There is a bit of unpredictability element associated with it as well, right? And these are the two core issues that we set out to solve with fast snapshot restore. And this is how it works. So when you have a volume, you take a snapshot just like before, now you have the ability to tag the snapshot into an FSR mode. So you can see, essentially, I want the snapshot to be FSR enabled, right? Once you have a snapshot that is FSR enabled, you can now create volumes from the snapshot with full performance, right? Access to all the data blocks on the snapshots. No pre-warming needed, no initialization needed, right? And you can create as many as 10 volumes from the snapshot. Now, your volume creation is based on credits that you accumulate. And I'm going to walk you through some more details of how you accumulate credits. But you essentially accumulate credits at one terabyte an hour. Right? So, so you enable snapshot. You accumulate credits. Based on the credits, number of credits, you can launch volumes with full performance and access to all the data in the snapshots. The benefits are, as I mentioned, speed. No pre-warming, no initialization, right? You get full access to all the data in the snapshot. Two, predictability. You can actually predict and control your RTO here, right, based on the number of credits and the size of the snapshot. And like I said, I'll walk you through a little more details of this. Third, scale. You can now have 10 volumes out of one FSR snapshot of enabled, right? So if you have um, use cases like virtual desktop infrastructure where you walk in on a, on a Monday morning and you want 100 desktops ready to go on, this is something that you can scale with 10 FSR enabled snapshots, for instance, because each snapshot can have 10 volumes. And so now you have 100 volumes ready to go, right? And third, lower cost. Uh, fourth, lower cost. So the cost that is associated with an EBS volume and an EC2 instance while in the pre-warming stage 
is always going to be higher than the cost of the snapshot, uh, FSR-enabled snapshot. Right? So an FSR-enabled snapshot will always be more cost-effective than the time taken to preload the data, pre warm the data, or initialize the volume. And as I mentioned, the use cases here, the obvious one being the virtual desktop infrastructure, um, um, or customers are also using this for uh, backup, um, backup and restore, particularly in the DR use cases. Uh, and certainly examples around, you know, I have a large database that I want to now ensure that I have that on uh, when I need it on Monday morning. You can have it FSR enabled and, and be ready for it when it goes. So some more details on how it works. So like I said, FSR is, works on a bucket-based credit system, right? And the bucket-based credit system essentially works on two parameters, the size of the snapshot and the rate of filling of this bucket. And it's at one terabyte an hour. So for example, if you have a 100 gigabyte snapshot size, you essentially take, it, it takes 10, um, 10 credits to be accumulated in one hour. So one terabyte for an hour, 100 gigabytes is one terabyte divided by 100, will give you 10 credits in one hour. Or vice versa, if you have a four terabyte snapshot, it'll take you four hours to accumulate one credit. Right? Once you have the credit, you can initiate a volume. That's how it works. And your cost is 75 cents per hour the snapshot is enabled. So, um, and, and if you have any questions and further details on this, we are available, happy to talk to you about it. But that's pretty much how it works. Very simple on a console. All you do is pick the snapshot. Say I want, I wanted to make it snapshot, uh, fast snapshot enabled. You need to pick the AZ that you would want the snapshot FSR to be enabled on, because the volume is created at a zone level. And you can pick as many zones as you want to. So particularly for the DR use cases, you, you can pick multiple zones that you would want this DR to be available on. This also works on a DLM policy. So with Data Lifecycle Manager, you can automate this. You can essentially say, at creation of the snapshot, I wanted FSR enabled. You can have also the first, like when you're doing incrementality on snapshots, you can say the last two snapshots needs to be FSR enabled or the last snapshot needs to be FSI enabled, the one before that can be disabled automatically. So that way you can continuously making, make sure that you have the latest snapshot ready to go when you need to go, right? Um, looking at the CLI, um, the, the API is enable fast, fast snapshot restore. Here I show you two zones, US East 1B, US East 1F. So now I've got with this API essentially, and I identify which snapshot it is, I have my snapshot enabled on those two, uh, two AZs. So that's FSR, or Fast Snapshot Restore. Um, and uh, you know, love for you to try it out, see how it works. We launched it, like I said, on November 20th. So for us, anytime we launch a feature, um, it's not the end of the game, it's like the beginning of the game. It's day one of the game. So this is a place where, you know, when you try it, we learn from you, give us the feedback, and, and, and next time I come here, I'm sure we'll have something new to talk about with FSR, right? Now, talking to you about direct read access to APIs, read, direct read access to snapshot, and this is something we learned from feedback from you as well, and, and I'm very happy to announce that just um, two days ago on Tuesday, we launched this feature. What this feature enables you to do is to list all the blocks in a snapshot, to read all the blocks in the snapshot in parallel, so in a very fast way, and compare snapshots and read change blocks on the snapshots. So list, read, take two snapshots, compare the snapshots, and get the diff in the blocks. So before I go into the benefits of the feature, um, let me take a little step back and say, you know, when we first started working on snapshots, this was in 20, 2008, I believe, um, we largely looked at snapshot as a backup for a volume, right? That was the use case. Um, since then, snapshots have been used for multiple use cases, and David talked to you about some of them, copying across accounts, changing encryption, um, 
copying across regions, uh, using it in the army use cases, and on and on. And what we noticed uh, from customers, and we got feedback from you as well, that, hey, you would like to read the data on a snapshot. And, and you would want to read even parts of a snapshot instead of scanning the whole snapshot to figure out which parts of the snapshots are relevant for you to read. So essentially, you are looking for access into a snapshot and read access to a snapshot. And one example use case of that was to actually track changes in a volume. And I'll walk you through an example use case for why folks were looking at reading data in a snapshot. So, so you have a volume, and, and you want to know the changes that are happening on a volume. right? And so what we saw customers doing was take snapshot A, change happens in the volume. Now you have snapshot B. So basically, if you have a delta between B and A, you know the change that took place, right? Now, for you to figure that out, you would have to do this. You would have to take all the data in snapshot A, do the full scan, right, into a volume, all the data in snapshot B, do a full scan into the volume, attach that to an EC2 instance, and figure out what changed, right? And we're like, hmm, that certainly we could do a little better than that, right? And this is what we followed with, which is we announced just three days ago. It's essentially on an API call, you identify snapshot A, snapshot B, and you get the diffs, just on a single API call. No EBS volumes, no EC2 instance. Isn't that cool? So now that's available to you um, in GA, and, and this is just a bunch of use cases that we see coming through. Um, the capabilities here, as I talked about, one is as much as 70% faster. Now you can take much more granular um, snapshots, right? get much smaller RPOs, and certainly much lower cost compared to your EBS volume and EC2 resources. Right? And uh, this is how it looks on a CLI. So your um, API is list change blocks. You give the two snapshot IDs, and the output here gives you a block index. The block index in this case is 0 and 6001, I think 6001 and 6003, right? In 0, it's actually a block that changed from the first snapshot to the second snapshot. And so we give you a block token for the one before and the one after. And then the 6001 and 6003 is a brand new block. And so we give you the block token for that. And now what you can do is you can use get snapshot block, use the block token, and read the data directly into really anywhere, a file somewhere. Right? In this case, I've got C temp. And you can do this in parallel. So complete direct access to all the, all the data on a snapshot with the capability of reading all of it in parallel. So we work very closely with our partners. A number of our partners find this extremely valuable. So thank you to all of them, and, and hopefully some of you are here. Uh, so thank you. And um, so Commvault, we've been working with Commvault very closely on this as well. And they have already started testing it, figuring it out on the workflow. And I'm very happy to invite Rahul on stage, who will tell us how Commvault is creating value for their customers using EBS Direct APIs. Thank you. Thanks, Rahul. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Elu. Before I get started, I just want to do check how many of you are involved in day-to-day -day backups currently. Okay, a few hands. And even though the talk about the APIs and how we have used it is related to backup, we can easily see how this direct APIs are impacting and affecting other use cases, such as DR or even dev clones. Uh, before we get started, just 30 seconds or less than 30 seconds about Commvault. We are an AT&T Bell Lab spun up. Uh, 20 years since then, we are now a public company. There's a lot of stats on there. Uh, just two that I want to highlight. Uh, we have 11 exabyte under management, 700 petabyte uh, in cloud. 
We are an AWS advanced technology partner and have various service integration. And we're involved in the uh, pre-launch of the uh, Deep Archive. So before I get started and explain about the API, I just want to explain how the backups are happening today. Um, and typically for most of the customers, there's a requirement of at least one full backup every month and one incremental backup daily. Uh, so this is what is happening today, a snap, mount, a scan, and a backup. Um, and I, I talked about two terms, full backup and incremental backup. I just want to talk about them a little more. A full backup, as the name suggests, is the full copy of the volume, and an incremental is looking at all the changes that have happened. What remained constant in case of full, as well as incremental backup, is the amount of time it took to scan. Because in case of full backup, even though we are only backing data only volume, uh, data only blocks, we still had to read through everything to find out the white space. In case of incremental backup, even though there are two blocks that have been changed, we still had to read through the whole volume to find out those two change volumes. So the end result is the time taken for full as well as incremental backup is, is humongous. And giving a typical customer example, there are hundreds of instances, or even in some cases, thousands of instances that are being backed up. And typically, one instance has two or three volumes totaling to about one terabyte of size. So we have done several tests in our lab, and what you'll see is the before and after. The top diagram is the same one as you saw before, and the down is the after. And you have seen the scan window has shrunk down a lot. And I've done tests with several volume sizes. I'm highlighting just an example of a 100 gig volume. And these are the numbers. An incremental backup that was taking 20 minutes for a 100 gig volume is now down to three minutes. And there are steps in here which, we have, which you can see if you add FSR, if you add the ability even to skip the mount, like right now there's a mount step in here. If you take out all of that, the incremental time is going to go down further. So you may not have a backup use case, and you'll say, why, how does it affect me? So if you're doing dev clones, the time taken to do dev clones has gone down. If you're just doing DR with your snaps, the predictability and how quickly you can recover the disaster site has gone up because now you're able to bring all of this very, very quickly. These are the same things. I've just put it in a graphic format. Now the full time and the incremental time, a full is 57% more efficient. And an incremental, what we found, is 87% more efficient. And as we add FSRs and, and de de parallel reads is another thing that has been added. If you add parallel reads for DR cases, if you look at the way we can span multiple volumes, you could see how the savings are going to add up and, and have a lot of impact on it. That's all I had. I'm going to bring Shailu and David. So we were very happy, uh, in summary, to be part of this test. And this was something that we have heard from our customers. I'm sure every single backup partner has heard about that, an incremental backup. And we are very happy to have tested this and uh, how these APIs are working. I'd like to call Shailu and David again. Thank you. Thanks, Raul. Um, so we, we'll be here to answer your questions. Um, Please complete your survey. Um, give us feedback. That helps us get better for this session next year. And um, thank you for coming to reInvent, and do look forward to seeing you next year as well. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>